Well, good morning, Forward Church. Thank you for joining us in this beautiful spot this morning. Uh, we're joined together in the spirit, and we're going to lift our voices up together in worship of a God who is so worthy of our praise. And as we jump into our first song this morning, we recognize uh, how, how God has loved us greatly. Uh, it, we read about the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being thrown into the fiery furnace for standing up for their God. And uh, they recognize that there's not just the three of them in there, they see a fourth person. And, you know, they ask, who's that fourth person? But we realize and we know that that is God. That is God standing beside them, helping them in their time of need. That is the God that we serve. That is the God that we lift our voices up to this morning as we recognize there is another in the fire. No matter what fire you might be walking through, no matter what water you might be caught in this morning, know that God is walking beside you and he wants to carry you through that as well. And we worship him because he is so good and faithful to walk beside us in each day. Let's worship him together this morning. There's a grace when the heart is on the fire Another way when the walls are closing When I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire standing next to me. There was another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding? How I've been set free There is a cross that bears the blood Where another died for me There was another in the fire All my dead left for dead beneath the wall I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore And should I fall in the space between What remains of me and this reckoning Either way I won't bow to the things of this world I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me Between 
all the things unseen and his reckoning. I know I will never be alone.
Let's come to this good, loving, faithful God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for your goodness and grace to us, for your unfailing and steady love in the midst of shifting and uncertain circumstances. God, you are good and faithful, and we can cling to that when it feels like the only thing we can actually hold on to. And God, we... Uh, we lift to you those who are struggling right now, God, whose mental health is just upside down and backwards. They're feeling lonely and isolated and need someone to draw close. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would draw close. You, uh, Jesus, you refer to the Spirit as a comforter and counselor. Our, our, you are our very present help in times of trouble. So God, would you draw close to those who are brokenhearted and struggling today? God, I think of those who are undergoing treatment and testing right now when the road forward seems uncertain. I pray, God, that you would, again, draw yourself close to them, that you would uh, bring assurance of your goodness and steady hand in the midst of that. For those whose jobs have uh, either been lost or are uncertain right now, God, would you continue to provide for them, whether that's through your gracious hand of providing a job or through your church family extending a hand to love and care for and surround them with the help that they need in this time. God, may your family feel like a family that is loving and reaching out and providing for one another in a way that shouts the truths of the kingdom of God through not just what we believe, but how we act and love one another in the midst of this. And God, I want to lift you the Hallorans today as they uh, meet with their kids soon after 15 months of not doing that. God, would the presence of Christ bring the hope of Jesus into their hearts? Would they be able to see uh, the love of Jesus emanating from Jim and Nancy? And God, when it awaken in their hearts what they know to be true, that you are good and loving and real, and would you reveal that to them in a powerful way? God, we think of uh, Eric and Valerie Nielsen and the work that they're doing in Quebec right now, assisting with uh, Ecclesia and and St. Jerome. And Father, would your hand of gracious provision be on that church? I can't imagine being a church in Quebec right now just with uh, all the lockdowns again and and the difficulties there. God, would you provide for ways for the gospel to go out for Eric and Valerie as they uh, serve and assist there? But as they prepare to move, God, would you, uh, again, walk this road before them, give them all that they stand in need of. Uh, We're thankful, Lord, that you continue to provide workers. I know this uh, one connection through P2C from years ago through Eric, and and God, you're bringing people to the field with them to to share the love of Jesus. And and God, there is such a need for people who are going to be co-laborers in the name of Jesus and building up the kingdom. God, thank you for providing that. God, that is such a gift. Um, And would you as things loosen up in Quebec as well, Father, would you provide greater opportunities to share the hope and the love of Jesus with their neighbors? I know they've been able to have some initial good conversations. God, would you continue to allow those doors to open up? And Father, for us here, as we're hoping for a a summer that would look a little bit more normal, God, would we not go back to the normal that we're used to? May the kingdom of God invade our hearts and minds and lives and priorities. And Father, may we, as your kingdom people, bring the hope of Jesus through our actions and through our words, through conversations with coworkers and neighbors, as we're increasingly allowed to interact with people, God, would we not just... uh, we complain about the year that was or or look forward to the hope that we have in a world with less COVID in it, God. But may we proclaim the hope of the God that loves us and gave himself for us. And may the hope of the kingdom be the first thing on our lips. Help us to be a people centered on you, establishing the kingdom of God here on earth. We pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Hi everyone, Josh here. It's great to be able to gather with you in person and online. If you're new here, we're so glad you've chosen to spend your Sunday morning with us. If you're already a part of the Forward family, it's good to see you too. Each week, we come together through our services, events, 
and ministries to love God, love others, and serve the world. Let's see what's happening this week at Forward. Hey Forward Church, as you may be aware, the government of Ontario has announced their plans for reopening. As part of phase one of the reopening, churches are able to meet without number restrictions while maintaining physical distancing. In light of this, we are excited to announce that as soon as the province enters into phase one, we are planning on doing outdoor services on our backfield. We've got tons of space for everyone and we'd love to see you. So make sure to join us and maybe even invite a friend along. As of right now, we are expecting the first Sunday we will be permitted to hold services is June 20th. If that changes, we'll be sure to let you know. We will continue to offer an online service option, but we will not be streaming our outdoor service. Also, please be aware that starting next Sunday, June 6th, we will begin our summer Sunday service schedule, which means we'll be going down to one service at 10 a.m. for both online and future outdoor services. We can't wait to see you all soon. Hi parents, we have a child dedication service coming up on June 20th. Our child dedication celebration is an opportunity for you to publicly express your decision to raise your child in a way that honors God. And it's a time for our church community to commit to partnering with you for the journey. If you would like to have your child dedicated on the 20th, please register for our online preparation class happening on Monday, June 7th at 7 p.m. You can register and find all the information on our Forward Church events page. As always, don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. Hey Forward, May 31st is our next Missions Monday, and you're gonna to wanna to be part of this because we're gonna hear from Greg and Katie Isaac and all the amazing things that are happening to them and through them since they arrived in Nicaragua just a few months ago. You're gonna to wanna to hear the story, it's exciting. There's some God-sized things that we're gonna to celebrate together. Here's what you need to do. You need to either text missions to the number on the screen or scan the QR code and you'll get the registration link. If you've been part of one of our Missions Mondays already, then we'll make sure you'll get the link and you'll already be counted in. Join us then, May 31st. You're going to be excited about what you hear. We'll see you then. Hey Forward, we have an exciting new resource for you to connect with that will help you find all the information you need as part of the Forward family. We would like to introduce you to the Church Center app. This app will help you connect and interact with your discipleship groups, register for events and classes, and help manage your giving and much more. To set up, search for and download the Church Center app in the App Store. Find Forward Church by location or search and choose your site. Claim this is my church. Enter your cell number or email for a login code and log in with your profile. Now you're in. You can easily navigate by choosing from the tabs at the bottom. Interact with your groups, register for upcoming services, events and classes, and also partner with us by giving. And by selecting your profile, you can update your profile with a current photo and update your information, as well as manage your registrations and manage your giving preferences. Our hope is that this will help you on your discipleship journey as we learn to love God, love others, and serve the world. Hey Forward, summer is quickly approaching, which means that our Camp Forward registration is underway. It's a great way for your kids to get out of the house, reconnect, and make new friends along the way. And kids, be sure to bring a friend from the community to join you in the fun. To register your children for camp this year, you can go to this link or scan the QR code. The early bird date ends on June 7th, so don't wait. And that's what's happening this week. You can find all of our announcements and events on our website at forwardchurch.ca. Stay connected with us throughout the week by following us on Facebook or Instagram. Now let's prepare our hearts for today's message. Have a great morning.
Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you today. Thank you so much for joining us for our service this morning. If you have your Bibles, open up to Matthew chapter 6. Uh, it's where we're going to be landing today. Before we get into the message, though, I have the great privilege of reading the bands of marriage and announcing the marriage between Ian Marcus McDonald of Kitchener, Ontario, and Julia Hope Baker of St. Jacob's, Ontario. The wedding is to take place, Lord willing, on Friday, June the 4th, 2021 in St. Jacob's, Ontario. And I just want to wish Julia and Ian all of God's great blessings in the days ahead on your wedding day and the years that you have ahead of you in your marriage. We're excited for you and uh, wish you the best during this exciting time in your lives. Well, we are here in Matthew chapter 6, and for those of you who are new with us, I want to welcome you today. My name's Kirk. I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and uh, we have been studying for the last number of weeks the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus' sermon to us to talk about what does it mean to be in the kingdom of God, to be citizens of God's kingdom. What does it look like? What's different in God's kingdom than what we experience here in our own normal everyday lives? And uh, today we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 5. Uh, but before we get there, I have a question that I want to ask you. What do you do when there's something that you know you need to do, but you don't know how to do it? Uh, now, I know that some of you, when you're faced with a difficulty like that, you just like want to forge ahead. You're just going to fix the problem no matter what. If you throw enough duct tape or Gorilla Glue or whatever at it, you know that you'll be able to fix it. Some of you think, well, maybe if I just ignore it long enough, it'll disappear and it'll go away. Some of us are smart enough to call up a friend or to pay someone else to uh, fix the problem for us because they know what they're doing and we don't. And then some of us, we like to go to YouTube because we know that if we search on YouTube, somebody somewhere on YouTube will know what they are doing. Well, when it comes to our spiritual lives, have you ever felt like the things that you know you need to do feel really difficult and sometimes you don't know what to do? Uh, like last week, Pastor Derek talked about generosity and you know, if you're already up against it with your, with your time and with your wallet, the idea of generosity just feels like, oh man, how do I do this in my life? Uh, and so you can feel like, where do I even begin to start in these kinds of moments? When you think about all the things that you know you're supposed to do as a Christian, or you know you're supposed to do to help your spiritual life, what are some of the things that come to mind for you that are the most difficult? Well, if you're like most people, uh, most Christians that I know, prayer would be one of those things where you go, I know I'm supposed to pray, but prayer can be really hard, and I don't know if I even know how to pray properly. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was a really smart person, he was a medical doc doctor, and he was also a really spiritual, deep thinker, uh, a Welsh preacher in the mid-1900s, he said it like this, if you have never had difficulty in prayer, it is absolutely certain that you have never prayed. See, praying can be hard because we sometimes, we don't know what to say to God. We, we don't want to feel dumb, and so we don't want to say something that's dumb. Uh, and so we go, oh man, I don't know if I can do this. And certainly praying out loud is a whole other ball game because we go, not only do I not want to sound dumb to God, I don't want to sound dumb to all the people around me. It can feel like uh, weird, honestly, if we were to be honest with ourselves, it can feel weird sometimes to talk to someone that we can't see. Or maybe it's one of those places where you've asked God for things and he doesn't seem to be answering and you're struggling and you're going, how do I keep praying and going back to God and asking him for things? And it can be hard and grueling to pray in those kinds of moments. Or, or maybe you're just used to praying certain prayers over and over again, but you do it, but it's just a routine and there's really nothing in it for you anymore. There are a ton of books on prayer. There are a ton of people who are experts in the idea of prayer. Did you know that if you were to Google how to pray, there would be over one billion search results that would show up for you. But I can't imagine anyone better than Jesus to teach us about prayer. 
Because here's what I want you to know where Jesus is going to take us throughout this time. Jesus is not only interested in helping us to understand the religious exercise of prayer, but he actually wants us to do so much more than that. Jesus' primary motivation through his whole life, his whole ministry, is actually all about helping us to personally encounter God. That's what Jesus wants for us in prayers. Not just to go through the motions of praying, he wants us to personally have an encounter with God. And I know, uh, just from talking to so many people, we desperately want to know that we can connect and have the these kinds of moments and encounters with God. The, the entire Sermon on the Mount, this section that we're in in the Sermon on the Mount, is not just a list of more religious activity to do. It's Jesus saying, here's how you can connect personally with God in the everyday of your life. And so we're going to get very practical in this sermon. And so I want to encourage you, if you have a phone with your notes section, you might want to jot some notes down. If you're writing notes down, make sure you're writing things down because I believe this is something you need to come back to over and over again throughout your life to, to remind yourself what Jesus wants to teach us about prayer. And the first thing that Jesus wants to say to us is that you may need to unlearn everything that you know about prayer. You, you may need to unlearn everything that you think you know about prayer. Uh, verse 5 of Matthew chapter 6, it says this, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they've received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. All of us have had things that have shaped our lives when it comes to the area of prayer. Uh, some of us have learned to pray by listening to others pray. And so if you're used to someone praying really simple prayers, you go, well, this is how I'm supposed to pray. If you're used to someone praying prayers that have big words in them, like sanctification and justification and righteousness, uh, those kinds of words, we think, man, I have to use those kinds of words in order to pray. And there's nothing wrong with using words like that. But sometimes we have learned to pray just simply by listening to how other people want to pray. Uh, sometimes uh, we've learned certain prayers by just repeating them over and over again in our lives. Uh, uh, you know, when we pray before we eat meals, we often will pray things like, God, would you bless this food to our bodies? When I was a kid in Christian school, there was, a, there was another kid who wanted to pray uh, God's blessing over lunch every single day, and his prayer was exactly the same, and I've always remembered it. His prayer was, Bless this bunch as we munch and crunch our lunch. Amen. And that was one of the ways I learned how to pray was by listening to this guy. Or what about a prayer that we teach our kids all the time? Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray my soul the Lord to take. Seriously, we've taught our kids how to pray by praying about dying. Uh, you know, we've, we've learned how to pray by memorizing some of these kinds of prayers. Even the Lord's Prayer. Some of you will come from faith traditions where saying the Lord's Prayer uh, all the time, whether it's every day or every week, was just a normal part of life. Some of us grew up in schools where that's what we did. We said the Lord's Prayer every single day in school. But did any of those things really help us to pray? As Jesus starts his teaching on, on prayer in this passage of scripture, he wants people to unlearn the things that they've learned by watching others. So he identifies two groups of people. He talks about hypocrites. And the only thing the hypocrites were interested in was, what do other people think of me? They, they were not interested in so much in connecting with God as they were about saying prayers that sounded impressive to all the people around them. And Jesus says, don't pay any attention to that group of people. But then he's also got another group of people, the Gentiles, where he says, hey, these guys, they heap up empty phrases in their prayers. They, they go through the motions. They say the same things over and over again, big fancy words. And maybe they don't even know what they mean, but they're saying them. 
And, and these people often just thought that this was my sense of duty to just say prayers in this way. And what Jesus wants us to know is that we don't want to be like either of those groups of people. That, that we need to unlearn the things we've learned from other people and come back to hearing what he wants to teach us about prayer. And so what he's going to say to us is that he's going to give us the right approach to prayer and then he's going to teach us uh, the right way to pray. And so we're going to dive into this passage of scripture. When it comes to the right approach to prayer, we're going to start in verse 6. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, when you pray, I'm going to stop right there. Jesus wants us to be intentional to talk to God. This is the right approach to prayer. That we have to be intentional. If we're going to have a growing relationship with God, you need to talk to him. That you cannot uh, live in this space where you go, I'm building a close relationship with God, but I never speak with him. There is an assumption that Jesus makes in verse 6, when you pray, not if you pray. I've talked to so many people who have said to me, yeah, me and Jesus, we're tight. We're growing closer all the time. My spiritual life is thriving. And then you say, well, can you talk about your prayer life? How are you doing in prayer these days? Oh, I don't have time to pray. I'm so busy serving God. Let me be very clear, church. How can you grow closer to someone that you never talk to? You see, we need to communicate. We need to be intentional in talking to God. But Jesus continues on in this verse. He says, when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Jesus says, go into your room and shut the door. And I, I want to just be clear. Jesus is not saying, like, go into your bedroom somewhere, find a closet, shut the door to your closet, and now you can begin to pray only in that kind of space. No, that's not what he's saying. He's not condemning praying in public. Because if he was, then he would have sinned against his own command every time he prayed in public. That's not what Jesus is going for here. What Jesus wants us to focus on is to focus on our communication with God, that that when we are going to prayer, whether we are in a public space or a private space, that there is like, there's nobody else around, that it's just you and God together in communication and in fellowship with each other. That is what Jesus is going for in this verse. Our approach needs to be not so much about a formula or a set of magic words to use. Jesus is more interested in making sure that we are focused on connecting with God. Be intentional. The second thing he wants us to learn about our approach is that when you pray, you need to remember that you're part of a bigger story. Look at verse 9. He starts by saying, pray then like this, our Father. Now, I'm just going to pause here for a minute. If you have actually a written Bible, uh, and not a Bible on your phone, but if you have a written Bible and you're open to this passage of Scripture, get a pen out. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to circle every word in this passage that is plural. Look, look at what Jesus says. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. If you were to audit the prayers that you've made over this past week, what percentage of your prayers would have been for yourself? See, there's nothing wrong with praying for your needs. We'll get back to that in a moment. But when Jesus teaches us the Lord's Prayer here, when he teaches us how to pray, he is consistently using plural language. He's reminding us that we are actually part of a bigger story, that when we become God's children, we become part of a family together. That our prayers are not just about me and God, but it's about us and God. And we are, we are living in a time where everything is so hyper-individualistic. It's my way, what I want, what my needs are. And we forget that sometimes the things that you pray for actually may end up impacting another person's life. Sometimes we say, God, would you do this for me? Would you do that for me? And we don't, we don't realize that there's actually a domino effect to other people's lives when we pray that way. And Jesus is bringing us back to this idea that the right approach to prayer is understanding you're part of a bigger story. 
If you've ever seen the movie uh, Bruce Almighty, and I am not endorsing the movie or the theology of the movie at all, but if you've ever seen the movie Bruce Almighty, there's a scene where we get a glimpse of what would happen if God said yes to every prayer that every person ever prayed. So you have all these people asking God, help me to win the lottery. If I would just win the lottery, my life would be perfect and better because I'd have so much money. So God says yes to everyone and they all collectively, individually win a grand total of five cents each. Or God, please help my sports team to win. Please, please help my team to just get out of the first round of the playoffs. God, please help this to happen. Well, if God said yes to all of those kinds of prayers, what would happen? Every game would end in a tie. See, Jesus is trying to teach us that our lives are part of a bigger story that, that involves other people, that our lives are all interconnected, and that should shape the way that we pray. If you really love people, you're going to pray differently when you pray from the perspective of us rather than the perspective of me. The next thing Jesus wants us to have in terms of our approach to prayer is to make sure we have a correct view of God. Look at verse 9. He says, our Father in heaven. Your view of God is going to directly influence the way that you pray. For example, if you believe that God is always angry with you and he's just like looking for the next moment to strike you with a lightning bolt, well, that's going to impact the way you pray because you're going to come to God from a sense of, almost like the kid who's being sent to the principal's office all the time. Like, what can I say to possibly get myself out of trouble right now? If, if you believe that God exists only to give you whatever it is that you ask for, as long as you just use the right words and the right formula, well, then you likely are only going to pray whenever you need something from God. But Jesus intentionally uses a couple of different words here. He uses our Father in heaven. Some of you really need to hear this today. If you're God's child, he's not sitting there evaluating every word you say in a prayer so that he can give you a report card on how well you did with your prayer. You need to understand God is a loving, gracious, faithful father who loves to have you come into his presence. You are not a nuisance to God. But others of us also need to hear this. God is not your personal vending machine either. See, for some of us, in our efforts to make God more personal, we've actually downplayed how holy and perfect and great God is. And Jesus, by using these phrases, our Father in heaven, wants us to remember that we are approaching a holy God who is big enough to just use words and create the beauty of the earth out of nothing. We are coming into the presence of a powerful, almighty God who just by his presence can make the entire earth shake. A God who knows everything and sees everything and whose very presence is enough to take a good man like the prophet Isaiah and to make him say, I am ruined because I've been in the presence of God. And yet that same all-powerful, all-knowing, almighty God is also your father who says he wants you to come into his presence to cast all of your cares on him because he cares for you. God is both bigger than you can possibly imagine, but also very present right now with you in this moment. He is very near to comfort and protect you and love you. And a great prayer life requires that we have both perspectives of what God is like. Albert Moeller said it like this, a paltry view of God will lead to paltry prayers. And so Jesus gives us this way of approaching our prayers. He's, but now he's going to move to teaching us how to pray. And I, I just want to say this as we move into this section. This is not a formula. Jesus is not coming and saying, just recite these words and you'll be good. Because his intention is for us to connect with God, as we've just talked about. It, this is also not a uh, uh, a thing where we go, okay, how can I make God do what I want God to do? That's not God's approach here or Jesus' approach here for us. Jesus is giving us the elements of prayer that are going to help us connect with God, help us experience God's presence in our life. 
And here's what I know just from my own personal experience in growing in prayer. If we pray, we naturally will cover some of these elements. All of us will. But very few of us actually cover all of the elements that Jesus teaches us. I, I used to have a really difficult time praying. I used to pray for like two minutes and it felt like two hours when I would pray. And the more that I started to wrestle with the Lord's prayer that we're going to look at and understand what Jesus is teaching us about how to pray, the more I started to enjoy being in God's presence, the more I started to learn that this is just an amazing opportunity to talk to God about so many different things. And those two minutes would fly by just like that. Praying all these elements are going to change your life and your connection with God. And there's six things. We're going to move quickly through these six things, but there's six things that Jesus wants to give us about how to pray. The first thing in verse 9, he says, uh, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. You need to pray with praise and with worship. Jesus wants you to acknowledge the holiness and the greatness and the faithfulness of God. So your prayers, when you pray, you should talk about all the things that are true about God. Describing his character traits, uh, all the things that you already know about what God is like. But then also take time to thank God for all the ways that you've seen him answer prayer. The ways that you've seen him at work in your life. And, and here's what this does when you do this. It, it will actually calm your heart and your mind when you come into the presence of God. I, I don't know if you've ever had the experience of like having a whole bunch of things going on in your life where you're distracted and, and you've got a million concerns and a million tasks that need to be done. And, and you're living in this space of, okay, I know I got to pray. And you start to pray and you get like 30 seconds into it and you're distracted by something else that's going on. And suddenly like you've forgotten where you were in your prayer and you have to come back. Well, when you stop and when you focus your energy on worshiping and praising God in your prayer, suddenly it blocks out all the other things that are going on in your life and your world. And you remind yourself that you are in the presence of the king. You are in the presence of your father. You're in the presence of God and he loves to have you there. All of those other things start to diminish in their importance when you focus your energy on worshiping and praising God in your prayers. The second thing Jesus teaches us, don't just pray with praise and worship, but he also says, pray with big things. Pray for the big things. Look at verse 10. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Through this entire sermon series, we've been talking about what does life look like to live in Jesus' kingdom? What does it mean to be a good citizen in Jesus' kingdom? But when we look around, it's not difficult to see that we are not living like we're in Jesus' kingdom. That the world around us and even in our own lives, we have so many places where we need to work and where we need to have God shape us so that we live as good, faithful citizens in his kingdom. And when Jesus tells us to pray for his kingdom to come, he's saying to us, you need to pray big prayers because you have a big God. You need to look at all the things that are around you in the world, wherever you see injustice going on, wherever you see things that are wrong that should be made right, wherever you see places where there is hurt and pain and brokenness, wherever you see people who are far from God and want nothing to do with God, in all those places you go, the kingdom of God needs to come into those places. People need to find life in Jesus. People need to know that Jesus is the way. That you pray for God's kingdom to step into those moments and those places and into those hearts. To bring people into alignment with God's will. When you see brokenness and hurt that doesn't line up with life in God's kingdom, you pray for God to change the story. And to bring his presence into that. I think about all the times that I've prayed for marriages to be healed. Why do I pray for marriages to be healed? Because broken marriages don't line up with God's vision, God's heart of a couple being one. 
I think just over the last number of months and, and year, when I think about all the division that has existed in the body of Christ, when I think about racism that has existed in our world, and I go, none of that lines up with what life in God's kingdom is meant to be like. I know that's not your will, God. So God, would you bring unity? Would you bring reconciliation? Where you see people who are being abusive and angry rather than meek and merciful, you pray for the rule of Jesus to come into their life. So pray for the big things because you have a big God. Do not become discouraged or disillusioned. Because ultimately when we pray for these things, what we're praying for is actually the return of Jesus when he will make all things right. But you shouldn't just pray for the big things. You need to pray for your own surrender to Christ. We need to pray for our own surrender to Christ. We need to pray for all the things that are out there, but we need to pray that God's kingdom will come and rule in our own lives. J.I. Packer said this, here more clearly than anywhere, the purpose of prayer becomes plain, not to make God do my will, but to bring my will into line with his. So where in your life do you need to surrender to God's will? See, it's really easy to pray for the things that are out there that need to be fixed and changed. But when was the last time that you said, God, your word says, blessed are the merciful, so God, help me to be more merciful. It's really easy to pray for the things that are out there, the problems that are out there that need to be fixed and changed. But when was the last time you looked at your own life and you prayed, God, the fruit of the Spirit is that I would be filled with more joy. God, would you give my life joy? And, and so we need to pray for our own surrender to Christ. There, there are so many times where people will pray for other things going on without praying for God's will to come into their own life. And Jesus is saying both of those need to come together. The first three elements of what we prayed for have everything to do with God. And now Jesus will shift the prayers to our own needs. In verse 11, he says, give us this day our daily bread. That we need to just ask for God's provision in the everyday moments of life. Whatever you need today. So here's what this looks like in my own life. When I'm praying, I will actually think through what's ahead in my day. What meetings do I have? What uh, tasks do I need to accomplish today? What problems am I facing today? And I will just say, God, would you please help me with these things that are in front of me today? Sometimes I need God to show up and provide something physically. Sometimes I just need... I need some emotional support. I need some spiritual support. I need comfort. I need courage. Whatever it is that you're facing today, Jesus says you can go to your father and ask him to provide for your needs today. Give us this day our daily bread. And then he continues in verse 12 and tells us that we need to pray for right relationships. He says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors that we are to pray for a right relationship with God and a right relationship with each other, that, that we would go to God and say, God, what are the things that are holding me back? What are the sins that I need to confess and ask you to forgive me on? But then we don't just stop there, but we think about our relationship with each other as people. And, and we begin to go, God, where do I need to reconcile relationships with other people? Who do I need to forgive? And who do I need to ask forgiveness from? God wants us, Jesus wants us to pray for right relationships. And then the sixth thing that he wants us to pray for is to seek God's deliverance from sin. Look at verse 13. It says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So let me just be clear, because there's sometimes a lot of confusion in this verse. Sometimes we get caught up in lead us not into temptation. God never tempts you to sin. If you are taking down notes, write down James chapter 1, verse 13. God does not tempt you to sin. So what is Jesus talking about then when he says, lead us not into temptation? Well, he clarifies what he means when he says, but deliver us from evil. You see, Jesus is saying that we need to be protected from the power of temptation in our own lives. That we know our weaknesses. We know our struggles. We know those places in our hearts, in our minds, in our actions every day where we are more likely to commit a sin. 
And that we don't just ask God to forgive us for past acts, but we actually ask God to deliver us from future sins, to deliver us from the power of temptation in our lives, to deliver us from, from falling into sin in the future. And so you pray, God, would you protect me? Like, I got really angry, and I'm sorry I got angry yesterday. God, would you protect me from getting angry today? God, I'm struggling with this sin. I can't seem to get out of it. God, would you deliver me from this sin? Jesus wants us to seek God's deliverance from sin. So what we have as we've looked at this prayer is Jesus giving us a, a framework, if you will. Now, you may not pray all of these things in every single prayer that you do. If you read through the New Testament, very rarely did everybody pray everything that Jesus describes here in this verse. But if you look at the entirety of someone's life, you should be covering these things in your prayers. This should be a normal way of connecting with God. Church, here's what I want to do. I, I, I want to actually give us a chance, not just to hear about prayer, but I want to invite us in this moment to actually enter into prayer together. So wherever you are, Whatever you're doing uh, right now, I want to ask you, put your phones down, close your Bibles up, put your notebooks away. Uh, wherever you're watching this, just kind of sit up, take notice for the next few minutes. Because I'm going to invite you to join into a time of prayer together as a church. I, I believe that prayer is one of those things that can really unite us. It unites us with each other. It connects us with each other. But it, it most importantly connects us with God. And, and so here's what I want you to do. I'm going to take us through the Lord's Prayer. And I'm going to ask you just to take a moment to pray for some of these things and to begin to practice this, living out this prayer in your own life. So you don't need to pray out loud. You can just pray in your own heart and mind right where you are. Uh, but would you just close your eyes right now and would you just follow along as I pray? I want to pray for you first uh, before we move into this. So, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. I thank you that you are a good God who is more powerful than COVID. You are more powerful than the things that are separating us and the space and distance that's separating us right now. And God, I believe that you can connect our hearts, our minds to you and with each other. And so, Spirit of God, would you come and just unite us to each other and with you in this moment. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Keep your eyes closed. And I want to just ask you just to take a moment and begin to praise God. Worship God. Talk about his character traits and, and the ways that you've seen him answer prayer in your own life. Take a moment in silence and just do that right now. Now I want to invite you to pray for his kingdom to come in the big things of life. Pray for people you know who are not yet followers of Jesus. Pray for their salvation. Pray for other big things that you see going on around you that God has put on your heart. Pray for God's kingdom to come into those situations. Now I want to ask you to pray for his will to be done in your own life. Ask him to show you where do you need to surrender to Jesus as king in your life today. Ask him to show you those places. Ask him to show you how you can change. Now ask for God's provision today. 
whether it's for yourself or for other people you know who are going through difficult things, uh, just ask God to provide what is needed today. Think about your day and all that's in front of you. Whatever you need today, ask him for it. I want to invite you to pray for right relationships. What do you need to confess to God? What do you need to ask God to forgive you for? Are there any relationships in your life that you need to make right? Ask God to show you those things today. And now just seek God's deliverance from sin. Ask God to protect you from the power of temptation to sin in your life. Name some of those sins that you know that you give into. And ask God to protect you from those sins. If you're reading in Matthew chapter 6, you'll notice that there is a phrase that's missing compared to the prayer that we pray when we say the Lord's Prayer. Uh, And even though Jesus didn't use this phrase, it doesn't mean the phrase is wrong. It's actually very honoring to God as as a closing to a prayer and very biblical. So here's what I want to do as we close this time of prayer. I want to invite you together all across this region in hundreds of homes as we've gathered together to pray right now. I want to ask you out loud together to just say this last portion of the Lord's Prayer together as we want to live our lives in surrender to the Lordship of Jesus, that we want to be people who are faithful citizens of God's kingdom. So let's say this last portion of the Lord's Prayer together as a church. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you, church. All I see is the battle. You see my victory. All I see is the mountain, you see a mountain move. As I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe. There's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. Yes, you do. When all I see is a cross, God, you see the empty too.
you go before us nothing can stand against the power of our god you shine in the shadow you win every battle nothing can stand against the power of our god and almighty fortress you go before us nothing can stand Before church, as we wrap up this morning, I want to do two quick things. First, I got a message from my wife uh, telling her that my four-year-old Asher was talking to the screen this morning trying to say hi. So I just want to say, hi, buddy. Um, good morning. And uh, just it's such a reminder of me of sometimes how we interact with prayer, that it feels like this one direction relationship. And there's not actually really interchange between the two parties, but we have a heavenly father who wants to see us and speak to us and have a deep and intimate connection and relationship that shapes us more and more into the image of his children. So good morning, Asher, and, and that's a reminder to the rest of us too. And as Kirk was talking about uh, praying big things and seeing the kingdom of God come, I couldn't help but think of the atrocities that we've discovered this week of hundreds of indigenous kids being discovered in a mass grave. And my heart breaks for uh, the indigenous communities and our brothers and sisters who are, are struggling and who are hurting for this and, and the reverberation of past hurts that is being dragged up right now. So I'm just gonna pray uh, for them now and then we'll wrap up together as a church family. Lord God, may your kingdom come. Our world is not as it should be. There are lives lost and not counted as beautiful image bearers of the creator. So we pray with our indigenous brothers and sisters who are hurting today. God, would you bring the peace of Christ in a powerful way? And Father, we know and confess that much of this was done with the name of Jesus attached to it. And God, would you bring healing in a way that only your presence can bring? God, would the name of Jesus not be tainted with these evils and atrocities and may you show yourself to be the good and loving savior that you truly are. God, bring healing and hope and renewal. Come, Lord Jesus, may your kingdom come. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.